Secretary of State John Kerry is in Japan today, where he's become the first sitting U.S. Secretary of State to visit Hiroshima, where he went to the atomic bomb memorial commemorating the 1945 U.S. nuclear attack, which killed 140 people in Hiroshima. The United States is the only country in the world to drop an atomic bomb, first in Hiroshima, August 6, 1945, then in Nagasaki, three days later. Kerry described the memorial, saying, quote, "...it reminds everybody of the extraordinary complexity of choices in war and of what war does to people, to communities, to countries, to the world." Well, we're going to turn now to another choice the United States made during its fight against Japan in World War II, the decision to imprison 120,000 Japanese Americans in internment camps across the U.S. Could something like this happen again? The 2016 presidential campaign has been marked by calls from Republican candidates to create a database of all American Muslims and to have the police patrol Muslim neighborhoods. Following the Brussels attacks last month, Republican presidential contender Ted Cruz sparked widespread controversy by saying, quote, we need to immediately halt the flow of refugees from countries with a significant al-Qaeda or ISIS presence. We need to empower law enforcement to patrol and secure Muslim neighborhoods before they become radicalized, end quote. Senator Cruz later doubled down on these calls in an interview on CNN. If you have a neighborhood where there is a high level of gang activity, the way to prevent it is you increase the law enforcement presence there and you target the gang members to get them off the street. I am talking about any area where there is a higher incidence of radical Islamic terrorism. If you look at Europe, Europe's failed immigration laws have allowed a massive influx of radical Islamic terrorists into Europe, and they are now in, in isolated neighborhoods where radicalism festers. Among the many to criticize Cruz for these statements was California Democratic Congressman Mark Takano, whose parents were placed in Japanese internment camps during World War II. As I watch leading politicians propose discriminatory policies targeting the Muslim community, I cannot be silent. Seventy years ago, my parents and grandparents were held prisoner in, during World War II without trial and without re other, a reason other than their Japanese heritage. In that moment, no one was willing to speak up for them. We cannot ignore the lessons of history. The Muslim community is the most frequent victim of terrorism and our greatest ally in ridding the world of extremism. Responding to Brussels by advocating for patrols of Muslim neighborhoods or suggesting that we torture our enemies is not only counterproductive, it violates the moral code that separates us from our enemies. Senator Ted Cruz's proposals came after Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump told Time magazine last year he didn't know if he would have supported or opposed Japanese-American internment camps had he been leader during World War II, saying, quote, I would have had to be there at the time to tell you. But he's called for a comprehensive database of all American Muslims, a ban on Muslims entering the country, and a wall to be built along the entire length of the Mexico border. Meanwhile, Democratic Mayor David Bowers of Roanoke, Virginia, also spoke sparked outrage last year after he used the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II as a positive precedent to justify suspending the resettlement of Syrian refugees in his city. He said, quote, I'm reminded that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt felt compelled to sequester Japanese foreign nationals after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and it appears that the threat of harm to America from ISIS now is just as real and serious as that from our enemies then, he said. Well, to talk more about one of the most shameful chapters in U.S. history, we're joined by two guests, Richard Reeves, award-winning journalist, best-selling author of several books, most recently, Infamy, the shocking story of the Japanese-American internment in World War II. Also with us, Karen Ishizuka, a third-generation American of Japanese descent, the curator of the nationwide exhibit called America's Concentration Camps, Remembering the Japanese-American Experience, her latest book, is titled Serve the People, Making Asian America in the Long Sixties. She also wrote Lost and Found, Reclaiming the Japanese American Incarceration. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Karen Ishizuka, you say it's wrong to refer to what happened to the Japanese as internment. Why? Well, I think that, you know, as—, as um, both uh, George and others have called it internment, because that's the common phrase. 
I George. Don't, George Takei mm -hmm. and others. Um, George Takei, who is the star in uh, Star right, Trek. Right, um, Japanese American. And, yeah, yeah. But I think, you know, when I was asked to um, uh, curate the show, Asian Amer uh, and th that we ended up calling America's Concentration Camps, you know, I had 19 advisors, including Roger Daniels, the historian who was the, probably one of the first um, major historians to write about the camps, as well as Aiko Herzig Yoshinago, who was the lead researcher on the commission uh, for the um, relocation and internment of civilians for the government. and. Um, all of those 19 advisors um, advised us to not continue to use euphemisms that have been used throughout the history um, of the United States to, to mitigate, basically, what had happened during World War II to Japanese Americans. What happened so, exactly? Well, you know, the people say that 120,000 people were interned, but, you know, the internment refers to a uh, parallel but different um, uh, set of uh, incarceration under the international laws. So only uh, so-called enemy aliens, including Germans, Italians and Japanese, were so-called interned in internment camps, and that was about 7,000 7 or 8,000. Um, in the meantime, they, the, there was a commission on um, war relocation authority uh, set up 10 camps that they euphemistically called relocation centers, mm -hmm. but that are now called concentration camps, because FDR himself first called them concentration camps. So it's not that the Japanese-American community started that phrase. It was really came from the government itself. So we were advised, and we continued to not use uh, euphemisms such as internment for incarceration, mm. relocation center for a concentration camp. Um, I wanted to correct something I said earlier uh, about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Uh, the U.S. dropped that bomb on Hiroshima and killed not 140 people, but 140,000 people. Now. Richard Reeves, I wanted to ask you about your book, Infamy, yeah. why you've written many books on many subjects, including on the Clintons, but why you chose to focus on what happened to Japanese Americans. Because I think it could, <coughs> could happen again to Muslims, to uh, border crossers, and I wanted to do my bit uh, to try to make that not happen. But I do think if a, a few incidents uh, the Supreme Court never ruled that the uh, the laws the White House and the military used to incarcerate uh, these people. That's still on the books. Uh, as Justice Jackson, Robert Jackson, said, uh, it's, a, it's a loaded gun on the Constitution. So that I had... Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at how few people, once you get east of the Sierras and the Cascades really know or believe this happened. Who was questioning whether the military had the right to do this at the time? Uh, no one was questioning. It was all internal dialogue between the Justice Department, the War Department, and the, and the President. And what do you make and of And then the there, was, there was great, uh, speaking of words, there were, uh, there were great disputes uh, internal. On, <clears throat> until they came up with a statement that avoided using the words uh, that partly drove the, uh, uh, the incarceration, that is, race and greed. Japanese Americans or Japanese are never mentioned in Executive Order 1066, which uh, Roosevelt signed uh, partly under the tutelage of Roger Baldwin of the American Civil Liberties Union, who was saying these were the people you would think would rise up. The ACLU. Uh, yes, but they, uh, Baldwin was a great friend and supporter of, uh, of Roosevelt, and he forbade his people to, uh, to, to talk about race in, in this sentence. The, the order doesn't say race, but it was only the Japanese Americans who were, who were rounded up. And uh, they, uh, but they, they would never use the real words 
And where were they held? Um, for, I mean, for First, people who are not Japanese yeah. American, right. I, this is a very little known chapter of American history. Yes, unfortunately. Uh, because it's also a continuum, beginning with the treatment of the Tories or the Indians before that, uh, after the revolution, and Irish need not apply and uh, anti Semitism. And the, the other has always been discriminated against after they came. Uh, as we needed the labor, they built the country, uh, but the and then they were discriminated against because they weren't us uh, until they were us, and now they are us. As to what happened, there were they established a war zone along the Pacific coast, uh, uh, claiming it was great fear. Uh, proclaiming that the Japanese, uh, the imperial Japanese, could invade the West Coast. Actually, Roosevelt and his people knew they didn't have the capacity to do that, but he wanted that issue uh, off the boards. And also, uh, so that they were first rounded up and kept usually at racetracks. Santa Anita had 18,000 Japanese Americans held in there, as did other racetracks, livestock, uh, fairgrounds, uh, that's where they put them for four or five months while they built from prisoner of war camp plans uh, the relocation centers uh, or the camps uh, in 10 different places around the country. California, Arkansas, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, Santa Fe was not, uh, was not a camp. Santa Fe was a federal prison. Well, that, that's why, you know, sort of the, the uh, difference between incarceration and internment comes up, because Santa Fe was an internment camp. And there were—my my grandfather was interned in Santa Fe before he was released and sent to Arkansas to join, join the rest of my family. But I think that's where, you know, it gets, it gets difficult to accurately talk about the, the uh, era because of the continued use. And I noticed that you, you know, use the term <clears throat> internment. And I have to, you know, also make a, a correction that, you know, I know that um, George Takei has was been it was one of the few who's been you know stood up to to Donald Trump and and asked him to really stand up for his words. But you know I'm not sure whether he uses the term internment or incarceration. Um, but he he was part of the Japanese American National Museum board when I did the America's concentration camps and was really one who stood up for our. Um, right to tell the story, our history, the way it was experienced. Uh, Karen Ishizuka, what was the role of the U.S. Justice Department in all of this? I mean, it was the military that was rounding people up. What about justice? You know, even when I was doing the exhibit uh, and I called the Justice Department, even they did not have a, a complete list of so-called internment camps. I think everything happened so fast and so— um, uh, one hand didn't know what the other was doing. Uh, so the Justice Department was, um, from my understanding, uh, in charge of the internment and of, of the so-called enemy aliens. So, you know, as I mentioned, both uh, uh, Japanese Americans as well as Italians and, and um, uh, Germans. The military were... uh, handled the, the relocate the camps. Uh, the just many people in the Justice Department were against uh, the roundup, as it were. Uh, but their voices were still. Some people quit over it, but Roosevelt wanted it, and uh, and he got it. And ultimately, what happened? When were Japanese Americans freed? Their property gone? Um, and what has happened since? Well, I would begin by saying that they seventy five percent of the. Uh, the net worth of the Japanese community, in, in California at least, uh, disappeared. On December 8th of 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, uh, Japanese American bank accounts were frozen so that they couldn't pay mortgages, they couldn't pay uh, insurance. And then the Attorney General of California, Earl Warren, uh, and his department ruled that their property was abandoned property and either sold or distributed it to their Caucasian uh, neighbors. It was, it was an outrage. 
And finally, your final words, Karen, on this as we wrap up our discussion. Um, well, I think that, you know, th there's still discussion, like you said, most people, many people still don't know what happened. Um, I think that it's— The compensation awarded to Japanese Americans how many decades later and what it was? So your question is Just about camp or the, the reparations? The reparations. Reparations. Um, that, you know, there was an attempt for reparations um, way back right after the war in the 50s, is, is, you know, if I remember correctly. But they were also asked at that time to re to produce receipts of what, what was lost, et cetera. So um, it's, it was a big fight, and it came from the community itself, and it was something that even Japanese Americans um, my parents, for example, did not want to talk about. Uh, it was a shameful, and, you know, in, in terms of um, blaming the victim, they really felt that, you know, let bygones be bygones. Um, the government. The, well, and, and, and Japanese Americans as mm -hmm. well. But I think, you know, and that's what, you we know, part of— five seconds. And we needed to bring out the truth and ask our parents to really talk about what had been um, covered up. Well, we're going to leave it there, but it certainly won't be the last time we discuss this. Uh, Richard Reeves, author of Infinity, the shocking story of the Japanese-American internment in World War II, and Karen Ishizuka, third-generation American of Japanese descent, um, who was...